holler if you hear me, and welcome to this special edition of Luke's Sketches, because, well, yesterday you saw that my channel passed a thousand subs, and now, yes, it was time to celebrate for a bit, only for then. Now I had to go and network and network and fight and scratch and scrape to get back up to past the 1k threshold but now all right we're back on up uh, as of this recording so you don't know whether or not it'll go up or go down again so that's why now the case of me finally getting past my main goal of finally getting uh, over the thousand now it's a matter of staying over a thousand we've got the two goals now for me is to stay over 1k and then from beyond that get past to 5k. That's the next big subscriber goal for me is 5k. So that's why we're going to be moving. We're going to be shaking because uh, you got to move and you got to shake because it took an awful long time of me not only just making my channel content something you would all really love to see, love to enjoy and come 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 around, come and come and come and come and come and come and but also because it was a matter of going out there and into the world, into the sphere of comic skate, and not just comic skate channels, but also other channels like That Umbrella Guy, which is why between That Umbrella Guy, Nerd Rotic, Heels v Babyface, The Midnight's Edge, and also uh, Culture Casino specifically, those are channels I now owe a lot to, and especially That Umbrella Guy for over the weekend really giving me the big accelerated push which then led to getting past, but then also having to regain things. So now it's up or it's down. Well, now I'm on the stage where simply it's the weight gain. I mean, waiting game, the waiting game of, you know, with YouTube where you've got to do the, the monetization three steps. There's the, okay, you got to set up the AdSense account. It's got to be approved of. And then there's step three, which is now the waiting process to see if they approve of it. So there is that now and where that goes is, you know, hopefully it's going to go better than what we're seeing now with uh, Rockstar Games and them stepping their foot. They're putting their foot down and how they are actually staying with uh, what we're seeing out of the new, the leaks about Grand Theft Auto 6. Now, I've mentioned before, I'm not really a gamer, but Grand Theft Auto, when that franchise really first emerged, like the Grand Theft Auto franchise is one where it's the rare example of a franchise that really, really, in anything, whether it's video games or otherwise, really gets its success, really hits its stride. The entry that is the best entry out of all of them is one of the sequels. Like Silent Hill would be another example. That's Silent Hill 2, not just being the peak of the series, but also one of the best horror video games, just one of the best video games ever really made. So you've got that to consider. You've got that to ponder. And Grand Theft Auto 3, I played that and played that and played that and played that religiously. I mean, I played that as much as or, or more as the Crash Bandicoot franchise and the, the 90s platformers. Those were really the, the jam, my jam, the ones I loved more than life itself. I would go and play those and play those all the time, along with Mortal Kombat, t tournament fighter martial arts games and the... Uh, of course, the platformer adventures. Hell, even Spyro and Croc. You also remember Croc when uh, Fox had their own de game developer, Fox Interactive. is famous for the uh, Alien Resurrection, the game, which I don't think ever even got finished. Or how, yeah, the first time you saw Croc, it was in a, a little preview in front of the VHS for the Casper prequel. Casper, Spirited Beginning, you know, with Steve Gutenberg and uh, Aunt Becky, who's now in jail for what she did to bribe her daughter's way into that college. You know, the, the influencer daughter, you know, that one? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, the the best thing out of, out of it came was uh, the greatness that was, Sp uh, say, a croc. I was about to say Spyro. No, Spyro, I think Spyro did get a little bit of a lifetime afterwards. But yeah, croc is something I don't really think ever got past that world. Um, uh, Gex is another one where that was supposed to be Panasonic's 3DO mascot, but the Panasonic was so bad in its sales that it wound up being the port to the PlayStation did better than actual 3DO sales for Croc. And that that's another one where it got a franchise, it got sequels, but it never got past the world of the PlayStation 1, which is sad because I loved Croc. But Grand Theft Auto 3 was really the first franchise, the first real franchise game of the PS2 era that I really loved and played. So going into that, and the, my, I would say it really was not the first example of like an open world game that I played. The first real example would be, I would still say Ocarina of Time really was important in being an open world kind of game where 
Yes, there was the story, but I had as much fun with uh, Ocarina of Time just either practicing my horseback riding or just go around town and just play on the uh, Ocarina or just find whatever kind of way I could to go and sword fight this character, that character, whatever it was. And Grand Theft Auto 3 was like that on steroids to the point where you could say it's the paradox of how I didn't even really ever pay attention to the story of what I was supposed to do. I would just go around, I, you know, just randomly picking fights with hookers and policemen, uh, stealing cars, just crashing through things like a crazy taxi. But if you could get out of the car, like that was something about crazy taxi. I loved that. That was another game I loved I in both the Sega Dreamcast and all over the uh, the. Uh, yeah, the Dreamcast, and whenever it was there at an arcade, I would go to. Loved it, loved it, loved it. But the thing about that, though, was couldn't you, you know, like, get out of the car and do other stuff? Uh, that's just me. There's always, like, the, the, the extra little creative thing you could do. And that extra little creative thing I could do was I could go around and uh, in Grand Theft Auto, I could drive around and wreck shit and steal cars, but could also go and get out and fight or, you know, do whatever I could to the cops. And the detail that you could go and p play with the radio. The different cars had different radio settings. There was that opera music that was in the trailer for Grand Theft Auto 3. I remember seeing that, hearing that. But you could also try other stations. And yeah, PS2 was great at getting uh, soundtracks. A, a lot of the best games for the PS2 had, and I don't mean soundtracks like original music. I mean, like you could actually go and pre-existing songs like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater where they had, you know, Motorhead and they had, they had a mix and match of hip hop and rap and rap and pop songs from different generations, different decades, what was contemporary at the time. But also that was the first time I ever heard Motorhead was Ace of Spades was playing on uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. And that was just beautiful stuff. I, I, I still remember that. That's uh, when it comes to being a, a metalhead, when it comes to loving Motorhead. Yeah, that's, I would say... That's my anecdote of my first experience with them. Something else I would also bring up about that, about the Grand Theft Auto franchise is seeing it, I could see it was a franchise that was knew its course and knew how to stay that course. Like seeing the other games like Vice City, Grand Theft Auto Vice City, that looked amazing. That looked even better. Then there was a San Andreas. And then there were the ones where they actually went back to numbering things. It was kind of like Resident Evil where... You had the first three games, but then they started doing, you know, the, there was that remake. Then there was Code Veronica. What was that? Resident Evil Zero. Uh, I'm guessing then they decided to go. And how about we just go back to having a number? Just just strip it. We've got this new idea of what to do with the same franchise. Make it more like action-based, you know, with the over-the-shoulder guns. And boom. We're going to go and you now just Resident Evil 4. And the franchise found its footing again. And by God, it just exploded and exploded and exploded. And Resident Evil still looks like it's good. I know that a lot of the post Anita Sarkeesian crowd were really, really irate over the Lady Dimitrescu and her, you know, very, very prominent bust. Which means, of course, I loved it. If only for I've drawn Lady Dimitrescu before, and she's fun to draw, but also because I really do genuinely uh, just just the concept of the. Uh, that kind of outrage that pursues is something I always enjoy and also not giving into it. Like Grand Theft Auto lived for being violent and political, politically incorrect. And then Saints Row, I would say, is like the imitation of that. It felt like it was trying to out Grand Theft Auto, Grand Theft Auto. But now you see the Saints Row game. And of course, we've got the Anita phenomenon there with the uh, what they're doing to go and get it, uh, the, get her technical advisory to get her approval as if she speaks for all women, as if she speaks for all of feminism. Uh, no one person like her would really speak for all women. I'd hope so. And then you get this with Rockstar and a company, a developer that was built on a lack of political correctness between the Grand Theft Auto franchise, which to the point where one of the games, its big image on the box and then the image that was advertised all over the place was clearly just a uh, rendering based on a photo of Kate Upton, where it's Kate Upton taking a selfie with a peace sign. And you're going to go from that kind of stuff to now developing this and developing it this way, which... Oh my God, you people really do have some kind of like suicide pact, don't you, with your company, with your developer. You really want to go out there and get your, you want to get your shit kicked in, don't you? You want to go and get a kind of world where 
you really feel like just alienating your audience. And then the opposite end of that, you've got the world of comics gate, which you know, lives for its audience, uh, which is something even before I knew what comics gate was that once I really got to see what they, the ethos of it, uh, of it was when I got to really see what the people really like, instead of just listening to whatever I was told through, you know, the, 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 the Anita type of people on Twitter or whatever kind of YouTubers or the people like at IGN or a bleeding cool, one of those kind of uh, websites, I really just saw, okay, no, these people really are about entertaining the audience. They are about growing a real fan base. They are about getting out there, getting the word of their stuff out there, but also getting the word of their stuff out there to entertain you. Yes, it's a real self-starting kind of business, which, okay, immediately I thought, this is something I really ought to be a part of. And I wish actually there were more people out there who really had that self-starting kind of enterprise where, okay, I need to be a part of this. I need to get into this world. And this is something where I can really go in there and do. And even if you're not really specifically, oh, I'm Comicsgate, still the idea of getting out there, being a content creator, entertaining a crowd, developing an audience, developing a following, growing that following, respecting that following, nurturing and expanding that following, and bringing it up and out into a world where then you've got something on your mind you want to create, and you go out there and you create it for those people that really want to see it, for those people that legitimately like what you do and want to see more or want to see what you can do in this kind of format. And an example of that, of a guy who's, you know, yes, he's appeared on EBS streams and other streams like that, but he's not really a guy who's always there, you know, next to John Malin is, of course, Eric July. And here's a guy who started out as a, as a rapper, already made his name as a rapper, went into the world of a podcasting, I would say, is what he said. Well, he calls for Canon's sake as podcast, so I'll take the man's own word for it. And then on the back of that, you get this man who is growing and getting out there. And now what's it? Three, it's actually passed. $3.6 million now for his stuff. All the back of this man and his elbow grease he put into it and, and looking at that. And my idea is that's inspiration. You really get to see somebody being a self-starter or someone's personality by looking at example and either getting angry about it and wanting to like tear them down. And that's where you get the, the troll army out there of people who really just, you know, are screeching at the sun over Eric July's success. Then you've got the kind of people who are there at the world, looking at the world and what he's doing and thinking, okay, I either got to do that or they're, if they had any kind of self-doubt about it and now they're thinking, okay, Actually, I can go and do that. I can go out there and get this kind of online audience and really go and grow an audience to then be able to go and have multiple different kinds of you know, real self-made creative performance of professional expression to go out there and get my get my life out there into the world, into something that's actually po probable, something possible, something profitable. And that's why the, the idea of interacting with those detractors, standing up for yourself against the detractors like Eric July does, is something I agree with, where he says about monetizing the haters. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. I get that. I'm going to go do another one, Daniel Bryan style. Yes, yes, yes. July is truly a guy who is doing what the people over there at Rockstar ought to be doing. But these corporations, it's like they think that you could, you will just consume whatever they want so what built their business model, they're now going to destroy. Uh, like, a, you know, my, my opinion of Red Letter Media has gone up and down. Like I resubscribe to them and back into them. But you know, when you look at their content or if they appear on other podcasts, they'll, when it comes to their opinions of Star Wars, when it comes to the prequels, of course, what they say about the prequels, they're going to go and keep consistent with that. They're not going to go and that is what grew their audience in the first place. That's what gave them their business model was tearing down the prequels bit by bit in this big, exp big expanding video essay. So what they're going to do, why would they go back against that? Now that the, the, a bunch of guys out of Wisconsin are smarter about their business than Rockstar Games. They're smarter about the business than whoever the hell is that developer behind Saints Row. I don't even, I don't even know off the top of my head. But they're another one where you had a franchise where, okay, GTA had a box art that was literally traced from Kate Upton in the prime of her modeling years. And then you had Saints Row, which at one point in its series featured the voice acting of Sasha Gray. 
this. Gro- Sasha Gray involved in the Saints Row franchise, I swear to God. <laughs> and uh, another one like that, Mortal Kombat. Hell, Mortal Kombat's especially a fan betrayal because what they did in the back when they franchise started in the early 90s was they stood their ground against the kind of outrage mafia to the point where there was a, a hearings. There's actually the, yes, the, the, the federal government got involved and that's what, thanks to Tipper Gore, and that's what led to the ESRB because then it meant no government censorship. I mean, that's the video game equivalent to what happened when the Comics Code Authority was developed in the 50s to avoid anything that would involve, you know, the government getting involved and controlling or censoring what content gets made or not, which I completely understand. I mean, I'm anti-censorship at all, but that was a sort of situation at the time where it was the best of what we could do so that there's less government involvement in what we are doing, which is always the, the far you know, wiser choice, the better choice for me. Uh, you, what your opinion is, uh, you can actually comment below about what you think about having you know, the ESRB being developed instead of government control, government censorship, or the MPAA, or what happens with the world of you know, comics and the well, comics code authority are long gone, but I do agree with some people out there I've seen in chats who say that now Twitter has become the new comics code authority where the, the, the publishers now are going by whatever Twitter's, whatever, you know, these glorified bots or literal bots on Twitter are doing instead of, you know, actual living, breathing people who are saying what they feel about this product or that. And they're not just going to keep consuming product. They're going to go and get themselves into a different product. And that's where you've got Eric July, that's where you've got John Malin, that's where you've got that umbrella guy, not just with his great work and really proving Johnny Depp's innocence and going up and going up against them at the risk of now even Rolling Stone magazine is now attacking that umbrella guy and his fans over there on his channel, but also the multiple comic campaigns that uh, Tug has now done successfully, I might add. I mean, really, really successfully. Him... And uh, the, oh, who else I'm thinking of? Billy Tucci getting really back in the saddle with creator-owned stuff. He, had, he was a guy who was a self-starter in the 90s. And now it's why this guy with a self-owned character has successfully translated into doing new work via crowdfunding in a way that other creators had a bit of an uphill battle to do because they didn't have the experience. He did. Now here's this guy who I think is over 50, and he's able to take to that stuff like a duck to water because he had the initiative and the talent to have already had that experience to go and go and go and do and do and do. Now, you that's where you get Cyberfrog like this. And this, since I don't have a copy of ISOM, uh, fortunately I'm not a backer, but now this is, and I wasn't even a backer for Cyberfrog Blood Honey. This is something I found on eBay. Uh, this one, although uh, a while back when this happened, yes, I was a backer on this piece, on this big baby, and you really ought to look at this if you have any kind of creative inclination as a real totem of you can succeed. You have that ability to go up there and grow and prosper. And to me, that's really just an example of, I would say, prosperity through just gr- to daily, daily work. There's uh, an expression when it comes to wrestling. And I mean the Kurt Angle in the 90s wrestling, not Kurt Angle in WWE wrestling, like the kind in the Olympics, yes. Uh, Mr. Rulon Gardner, if you remember him, where it's uh, the training, the training, the training. It's called the expression is embrace the grind. You really have to embrace the grind like well, I have. And that's why, I mean, before this, besides the stuff you see me do on my streams, there's also this stuff I draw and draw and draw. You know, I'll take the it's it's the other things, the other warm ups, the other things I do to get my work developed and improved and growing and growing and growing to get my name out there and also show, hey, here's what I do. You know, these the doing the work like this on my channel is really me showing the receipts of, yes, this is how I am. This is how I do it. And that's why for everyone out there who has gone on this journey with me and has grown and grown in and helped this develop, I'm always going to be grateful for every single one of you. And for those along the lines who helped me, you know, I've got my longtime subscribers like Christopher Tardis or Relentless or newer subscribers, like I mentioned, Huron of Alexandria and Dead Punk Gage, who are regular peers, or of course, Nick Markins, my first long term, regularly appearing loyal subscriber, whom I will always have his respect for, for being there from right there in the early days. I will not forget any single one of you. That's why, I mean, even just by association, because it was the uh, moderators on Tug's stream Saturday night, the 
the Salt Storm 007 and Sheila Aliens on the Yellow Flash stream that same night, and also Gelp Walker going in there and circulating my channel link. And anyone else out there who now has been commenting on videos or streams lately that I've supplied my channel link to, please, yes, you know, continue to go there because we know that it's a matter of I'm not slowing down, I'm not quitting. Instead, I'm just going to be ramping up. If I'm not drawing, I am out there networking. I'm, I'm somewhere. If it's not through my only other social media outpost, Instagram, if it's not through the me uh, doing work on my channel, it's going to be me through my streams or my uploads. I've got that skill, or the, that's not a skill so much as the determination. There's the, the Pink Floyd song, Learning to Fly. That's the, the, the main chorus of the, of the song. The sole intention is learning to fly, conditioned, grounded, but determined to try. Yes, that's, that, that ought to be like a, if we could get the rights to it or if we could play that song without worrying about a copyright strike, and then yes, we ought to have that learning to fly be the, a little credo for those of us out there who are developing, who are building to a crescendo of being right there alongside uh, a tug or an EVS or a Malin. And it's not my opinion. I mean, I know I'm right. And I thank everyone tonight for watching. I thank you all. Don't forget to the new viewers out there, please subscribe. And to my returning viewers, don't just check that you still are subscribed to make sure to go and share the, to share this video, share my channel link with everyone else out there so we can continue to grow and develop and develop, develop. It's not just my channel. It's not just me. It's us. It's uh, my subscribers, my mods, all of you also have a very vital part in this. And I'm, that's why I'm very vital and grateful for all of you as, you know, Tug would be for, as he calls them, Tugs Thugs. Well, you're my space cowboys and my felines out there. Besides that, of course, besides the liking and the sharing, there's also, do not forget, since now I'm on the waiting game where I'm waiting to set for the approval of monetization, the best way to support my channel is through my online art store where I have my pen and ink illustrations for sale, 25 bucks plus shipping, my color drawings are of course also for sale for 20 bucks a piece plus shipping. I also have my trusty little sketchbooks like these ones I've been doing. They are 25 bucks a piece plus shipping as well. There are also commissions available. You can commission a pen and ink piece for 50 bucks plus shipping and they're the last item in my illustration categories. You can also commission a color drawing. Color drawing commissions are the last item available in my color drawing categories and those are only 25 bucks. You can also get out there and commission a trading card. Trading card art commissions, they are are only 20 bucks plus shipping. They are the last item in my coffee sleeve super babes category. So besides that, besides all of that, you can go out there and get yourself one of those or simply donate. No, in a sense, uh, super chats are not available in streams or in video premieres yet. If you just want to send out a little scratch, any dollar amount from any denomination around the world, you can simply leave a donation in my store. Donations are the first thing you see in my art store right there. Anywhere, anytime, I will sincerely thank you. And do not forget, whatever you buy in my store only comes with a flat shipping fee of $5 for one or several things. But... Remember, if you uh, live outside of the USA and you want to buy my art, do not forget that my store cannot receive orders for items outside the USA unless uh, you go and make your payment as a donation. To my foreign friends out there, you want to buy my art to commission me, it has to be done as a donation where you simply donate the amount of what you want to commission or the amount of things you want to buy with an additional $25 US included for the international shipping and handling fee. And when you do that, then your items will ship the next day like it would for any of my American friends. So until then, I want to thank you all for watching. Let's keep growing. Let's stay over the mark. Remember, felines, slam it, lick it, suck it, and see you, Space Cowboy.